Let's lift our voice. Jesus, we love you. Thank you. That's right. If you want to clap, clap. Jesus, we love you and thank you for being here with us this morning. Pray that you would have your way. We pray that you would minister to every heart, every life. Open us up to what you want to do today. Come on, come on, lift your voice a little more. Let's just provoke the atmosphere right now. Come on, bring it down. Jesus, we love you. Have your way. Speak to him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's worship.
vision, the people perish. Now, this is true for uh, individuals. Just ask someone that just graduated from college, and you ask them, well, what are you going to do? They need a vision for themselves. It's true for families. It's true for churches. But a vision is also true for missionaries. Why would someone just decide to sell their house or go to another country? But they would have to have a vision of what God is calling them to do. And I would like to uh, review uh, a missionary that has already passed away uh, a few years ago, Brother Benny DeMerchant. Now, Brother Benny DeMerchant in 19... 64, now that's almost 60 years ago, 1964, he was appointed a missionary to Brazil, but not just to Brazil, but to the Amazon basin of Brazil. And uh, he was here about 25, 28 years ago, and uh, it was just a joy to hear him preach. And he was relating a story about how him and his wife, Teresa, went over there uh, the city is a little bit hard for me to pronounce. I think it's Manaus, but, you know, I don't speak Portuguese, so I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. So they moved into an apartment that they were renting, and they went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, they woke up. There was a roar coming from somewhere, and they jumped out of bed, and they said, What is that? And then they realized that they rented a place near a soccer field. Someone just scored a goal, and the 80,000 people stood up and said, Goal! Can you imagine that? Out of a dead sleep. Now, you know, if you're not a soccer, a soccer fan, you might not get it. But if you're a soccer fan, you understand. And you know what? In his mind... He thought, someday, I'm going to have that stadium filled. And the people are going to stand up and say, Jesus! <laughs> this man of God had a vision. And before the course of his life is over, they had 93 Bible schools in that area with 5,000 students. He had a Cessna airplane that he flew up and down the Amazon River where he would land and people would take their canoes and their boats to go to church. Hallelujah. And the United Pentecostal Church in Brazil is like one and a half million people. It's, you know, in the future it's going to be two million. So this happens when a man of God has a vision. And so when we come before you for offerings, for missions, remember that you're giving to men that have a vision of what God has called them to do. Amen. And so I'm reminded each one of us is a child of God. What is our vision? What has God asked us to do? Are we reaching for that vision? And I've sort of asked myself that question lately. You know, what is my vision? Well, right now, my vision is being a Sunday school teacher. <clears throat> and I have to confess that I was a little bit discouraged because I only had one student. And I thought to myself, should I just give up? Should I just say... <laughs> Let someone else a little bit younger than me do it. Maybe I'm too old. <clears throat> Maybe I should just retire. <clears throat> but something in my heart said, can't do it. Can't do it. And then uh, with that one student, I said, we're going to pray for six children. 
We're going to believe God that we can have six children in our class. Didn't happen right away. But eventually, we had six children. And that might seem like a small thing. But really, each person in this auditorium needs a vision of what God is asking you to do. Amen. So we're going to stand, and I don't know why, but we're going to pray for the country of Brazil. I couldn't even tell you right now the names of the missionaries that are there because I could have looked them up and written them down. But let's just pray for that country. Oh, and another thing that the church in Brazil has sent 11 adults as missionaries to other Portuguese speaking countries. Amen. Because someone had a vision. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the country of Brazil. Lord, we thank you for the people of God that are serving you there. We don't know what trouble they're facing, but we know, Lord, that you are present. Hallelujah. In the lives of your people and that you will bring victory, Lord. Hallelujah. We ask for your blessing upon this nation today. In Jesus' name, bless the Brazilian people, Lord. Let them experience a great revival. And we pray in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord this morning. You may be seated. God bless you for standing today. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I know that there are many needs all over the sanctuary this morning, but we serve a God that can answer every single one of them. Amen. We need to remember W.F. Riles this morning. He is suffering tremendously in his feet. He's not able to stand. Uh, not sure what it is. Maybe gout. Uh, but they covet your prayers. And also that we would pray against the violence in our community. You know, it's only been two months, and there's been 11 or 12 murders so far this year, and we've got 10 months to go. But I know that if the Church of Columbus will stand in the gap, that we can prevent things like this from happening in our community, and we can be a powerful voice of prayer. Amen. And uh, it tells us in Isaiah 43 and 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And it's comforting for me to know, as well as you this morning, that we have the Lord's assurance and these same promises, and he is going to protect and help us. And if we call upon him in our need and in our time of trouble, he is not going to despair. He's going to say, yes, I hear you, my daughter. Yes, I hear you, my son, the child of God. It is comforting to know that those promises are still available to you and I today. Now think about this. When the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea on dry land, the Egyptians were drowned in the same waters that delivered Israel. You're special. The fiery furnace that was prepared for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was heated seven times hotter because they refused to bow to the culture of their day. Amen. And uh, that image, amen, they refused to bow because it represented they, something that they did not believe in. Uh, yet the very ones that threw them into the fire were consumed, but they came out with not a hair on their head singed. And I don't know about you this morning. We serve a mighty God that can do the impossible. He is the one we magnify this year and every day of our lives. Why don't we stand? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I don't know what you need this morning, but I want you to know that he is absolutely the answer and the protection that you seek. If you will call upon him, he is going to answer and deliver you. Shall we raise our hands this morning? Heavenly Father, we ask that, Lord, you would touch WF in his body. Lord, he has been so faithful in coming to church and we ask that you would prevent the enemy from attacking him we also pray lord god for our community columbus georgia
Georgia, that, Lord God, you would stay the hand of the spirit of murder in this place, and that, Lord God, you would release joy and peace and safety. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one that has raised their hands and their hearts to you this morning. They are trusting you, Lord God, with the outcome of their situations, and we give you praise, and we give you honor this morning.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Great to see you in the Lord's house today. We're in a good place. You know, years ago, folks confused Saturday with Sunday. They thought Sunday was the Sabbath. But Sunday is, in fact, not the Sabbath. That's Saturday. Amen. Amen. So we're not here on the last day of the week. We're here on the first day of the week. We're getting our week started off the right way. Hallelujah. Welcome to all of our guests. God's Spirit has prompted you to be in God's house today. And we are so glad to see you, to see that you've responded to the Spirit of the Lord. You know, most of the time, folks don't even realize that's what's happening to them. That's right. And they just get up one Sunday morning, and because somebody invited them or because they feel, I don't know, I need to be in church today, and they don't know exactly why, well, uh, let me tell you why. God did it. And you're in the right place at the right time on the first day of the week. Hallelujah. Welcome to all of our saints. We are in God's house today, not just any house, God's house. <laughs> you know, one of the most memorable vacations that I ever took with my family was a trip to Jekyll Island near Brunswick, Georgia. It's been almost 40 years ago, and uh, my wife and I and our three children at the time, I think LaVonda was about 13, Scott was about 11, Carl, I believe, was around four. <clears throat> and uh, if you've ever been to Jekyll Island, you, depending on the time of the year, you know it can be a A painful experience. <laughs> I have never in my life seen that many mosquitoes. We fought mosquitoes the whole time we were there. <clears throat> we drove around the 240 acres where the super wealthy 100 years ago had uh, what was called summer cottages. And we took some pictures of the uh, 33 historic homes that were there. And uh, those cottages look like mansions to us. Uh, but, of course, to the affluent, they were considered little more than cabins. They only lived in them about three months out of the year. <coughs> uh, people like the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, the Pulitzers, the Goodyears, they were all neighbors on Jekyll Island. Well, we took lots of pictures <coughs> to record the memories that we made of the, in the, during the trip. I bought a photo album when we got back home, and uh, 
Labonda was put in charge of organizing the family's memories of that trip. It was a really, really great time spent with our family. Uh, I wonder if anyone else has had a day or an event in your life that was so uplifting, so enjoyable, that it left a, just a delightful, indelible mark on your brain. Anybody ever experienced anything like that? I think most of us have at one time or another. <clears throat> well, David in uh, Psalm 8410 records, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Think about that. One day in God's house is better than a thousand days anywhere else. The composer of the psalm is saying, one day in God's house is better than almost three and a half years any place else. We come to God's house to magnify the Lord and exalt His name together, and suddenly God is once again the creator of time and eternity, the architect of the universe, the skilled artist whose brilliant use of gorgeous colors and subtle shades and masterful tones leaves us all in awe and wonder at the earth that he has created from the songs that exalt his name to the sermons that reveal the greatness of his majesty we experience it all right here in God's house no wonder the psalmist said for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand anywhere else so I'll say we're not just in any house today we're in God's house and one day here in God's house is better than a thousand days anywhere else. Well, Pastor, I don't feel that way. You know, if you've ever been to the Vanderbilt Mansion, is it Vanderbilt in uh, Biltmore Mansion in uh, North Carolina? If you've ever been there, that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the biggest house in the United States, the biggest single dwelling in the United States. My wife and I visited there a few weeks or uh, a few years ago. That is an amazing place. It just got, it has rooms everywhere. You go this, you know, seems like you go down here about a mile and a half of rooms and about a mile and a half down this way. There's rooms everywhere. But you know, I took it all in. They wouldn't let us take pictures. You had to buy theirs. <laughs> well, I capitulated and bought a couple. I think I bought a book. <laughs> But I didn't walk in there with my eyes closed. I paid to get in that house. So I took it all in. I was even tempted to take a couple of pictures. That's how magnificent it was. You say, well, I don't feel anything when I come in here. Well, open your eyes. Open your heart. Make bare your spirit. And I'll guarantee you, a day here is like a thousand anywhere else. Glory to God. Glory to God. I love God's house. You love God's house? Well, we'll be announcing the total amount of our vision pledges next Sunday. And the reason that we're waiting, which we always do, because there are always folks who uh, were working or out of town or sick or for some reason weren't able to attend last Sunday who always pledged. So we normally take a couple of weeks to allow the pledges, all the pledges to be made before we announce the final total. By the way, if you have not received a vision card for a pledge, would you mind raising your hand real quick and let the ushers run a pledge card to you or a pen or whatever you might need? All right, I see a couple of hands. Anyone else? <coughs> Uh, as in our missions pledges, we encourage 100% participation. Let's all get involved in doing this. Why not? It's, it's, we built this place for God. Why not all be a part of it? So will it get me to heaven? <laughs> no. Afraid not. <laughs> but you know what? <clears throat> it, it might reap the benefit of God's blessing for you. Hallelujah. All right, the ushers passing those out. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let me just tell you that, uh, how, many, how many remember our goal? How much? For those of you in the nosebleed section, that was 400,000. 
all right? <clears throat> We've achieved 98% of that. So if you did not get a pledge card, be sure to get one and fill it out and turn it in before you leave today. Let's pick up that other 2%. So, the pastor, are we going to do that? Of course, we'd always do. We always do. Some of you may or may not realize we're $50,000 more this year than the pledges last year. But let me say what I just said again. We've never failed to meet our pledge promise. Never. <clears throat> will we do it this time? Of course we will. I'll tell you another thing. Every time you come to the Red Sea, it will part. Well, <clears throat> a $1 bill met a $20 bill and he said uh, I haven't I haven't seen you around here much where have you been and the $20 bill answered well I've been hanging out at the casinos uh, went on a cruise did the rounds of the ship back to the United States a while uh, went to a couple of baseball games to the mall you know that kind of thing how about you what have you been up to oh you know same old stuff Church, church, church. Let's do better than that today, shall we? The greatest characteristic of love is giving, so let's demonstrate our love for God this morning and give. Hallelujah. Let's pray together, shall we? Precious Jesus, only you loved us before the cells came together that formed our mortal body. In your omniscient wisdom, you even became the lamb slain from the foundation of the world to ensure our eternal life would be spent with you. There's no God like you, Jesus. We thank you for watching over your people, for caring for us, for supplying all our need according to your riches and glory. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the labor of our hands with much fruit. Bless your people right now as we return to you the first fruits of your blessings. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. God bless you as you give. Story, how he brought us out.
of Jesus. God, I ask you to purify our hearts, purify our minds. Would you create in me a clean heart? Church, would you pray over your mind for just a moment? God, all distractions that have entered this room, I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Would you come into this moment right now? Would you come into this moment right now, Jesus? We need you to move on our behalf today. God, we can't make it another day, another moment, another step if you're not in this building. We need you right here. We know you're omnipresent, but God, we want to respond to your presence, which is always here. We want to respond to it, Jesus. And the church said, in Jesus' name. And the church said, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Isn't it good to be in the house of God today? I said, isn't it good to be in the house of God today? Of all the places you could be, I'm so honored that I get to be here with you worshiping God together. If you will, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Acts chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to start in verse number 10. Um, that's, that's a good verse. <laughs> um, I give honor to Pastor Shepherd. Um, we have such a wonderful pastor and pastor's wife, do we not? We are blessed with the absolute best. God has blessed us beyond measure. And Sister Shepherd, I don't say it often enough, but I appreciate and I love you so much. And uh, you have been so kind. And she is such a wonderful example of what it is to be a follower of Christ. And I give honor today to the ministry here. We have consistent godly men that preach and teach the word for exactly what we need in the time that we need it. Now, it's one thing to have a great word preached, but it's another thing for us as individuals to receive that word. It's one thing to have great teaching, but it's another thing to receive that. That's on us. We are blessed with the absolute, the absolute best. I appreciate you, the body of Christ, and I love you. You keep each and every one of us accountable. I give honor to my beautiful wife and my, my beautiful daughter. I'm, uh, I'm the poster child for blessed beyond measure. <laughs> And I don't mind I don't mind bragging about them. Before I keep you standing too long, let's go ahead and move on into the scriptures today. Acts chapter four here, Peter is with John standing before the Sanhedrin, and the council demands to know how Peter healed a man who was born lame. Peter tells them the same thing that he had told two groups before that he had stood in front of. And he says this in Acts 4, verse number 10, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone of, that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. As you close your Bibles, I'm going to preach for just a moment on this subject, the cornerstone. The cornerstone. I don't do this often, but if there was a subtext, it would be the reference. What is the cornerstone in your life? And what do you reference as a child of God to keep you on track? Would you pray with me, Jesus? We come before you one more time, and we ask you to move on our behalf. God, I ask that you open the ears, the eyes, and the hearts of each and every one of us to receive a word that you have for us today. Let us be willing to hear it 
and willing to apply it. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. As you're seated, could you give the Lord one more good hand clap of praise? <laughs> From uh, all of the allergies and everything, I don't know if anybody else has been dealing with it, but I, I told the sound booth before I came up here, it sounded like I swallowed a box of nails. So I hope you forgive me and pray that my voice will sustain all the way through, but I believe God's going God's to help me. As mentioned multiple times in Scripture, God is the cornerstone and the reference upon which the church is built. The Bible gives a clear understanding of the great importance of God Almighty as the divine underlying strength of the church. Furthermore, we know that Jesus and God are one. We know that they are one and the same. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I and my Father are one. There's no confusion about the Godhead. It's as confusing as people may want to make it. There is one God, and his name is Jesus. He is God manifest in the flesh. And when we build and construct our spiritual life, it must be built on Christ alone. Even when time is difficult and life gets hard, we must know who God is and who we are in reference to Him. Job, as faithful and committed as he was, can only imagine, dealt with this battle. Job, in a low place, he challenged God's justice. And God responded, Job, you do not have sufficient knowledge about the complexities of the universe to debate my justice. With 77 questions, God made it plain to Job, especially in Job 38 and verse 4 through 6, as God made it clear. He said, where were you? When I laid the foundations of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding, Job. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it. On what were the bases sunk. And who laid the cornerstone. Job, if you're going to question, then answer that. Job, where were you and who are you to question me? I am that I am. Before there was anything, I was. After everything is gone, I will be. Everything that you see, Job, is here because of me, the cornerstone. Everything that happens, all the movement of the earth, the solar system, the stars that are perfectly aligned, the perfect distance that we are from the sun, the gravitational pull of the moon, everything was perfectly placed by a God who said that the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. He is the cornerstone. We see this furthermore in Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who was laid as the foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. 1 Peter 2 tells us, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. God, God does not rule from a foreign land. God is not a distant king that does not see the intricacies of his people. God has not forgotten his people, nor has he changed his, his ways. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, he has not changed. He has not grown lazy, nor has he fallen into a slumber. But instead, God has purposefully laid himself 
as an integral stone into the structure of his church. We are built on the stone of God. Since ancient times, builders have used cornerstones in their construction. A cornerstone is considered to be a principal stone. Principle is defined as the first in order of importance. When that stone is laid down, everything is based off of it. Usually placed at the corner to guide the workers in their construction. When in doubt, they could always go back to where they began. When there was a question as to if they were square in their structure, they could always reference that stone. This stone was usually the largest. It was the most solid. It was the most carefully fashioned to do what it was designed to do. Support the edifice. Once the cornerstone was set, it became the basis for determining every measurement in the remaining construction. Everything was aligned to that cornerstone. All other stones were laid in reference. That cornerstone marked the geographical location by orienting the building in the direction it would go. If you want to know where the building is going, check the cornerstone. If you want to know where we started, check the cornerstone. If you want to know where we're going to be facing, check the cornerstone. Because after all is said and done, and I don't know what's happening in the world, I can go back to where I began and know where I'm going. Careful, careful measurements were taken. To ensure that that stone was laid perfectly. When God formed the foundation of the earth, there was intentional actions taken. It was not by accident. To ensure the proper alignment as a reference for the rest of the building, the builders would take sidings as they built the rest of the structure to make sure that they were not getting off track. They would look back down the line to make sure that where they were then matched where they came from and was properly set to where they wanted to go. Why is this so important? It's because this was a fact of life and death for the entire weight of the edifice rested on that stone in the corner. If ever that stone was moved, the structure would stand no more. If ever it was taken out, there was nothing there to support and to make sure it remained. The cornerstone. The cornerstone. The cornerstone. Everything else may be struggling and, and, and sometimes life can seem to pull things to the left or to the right. And I'm wondering at what point I can get back in alignment with where I need to be. There need not be a question if I could just get back to the stone. You and I could debate all we want, but there's a stone. You and I could try to lean left or lean right. There's a whole lot of liberalism and conservatism, but there's a stone. There's a reference. There's a point to measure from. In the days of Isaiah, Israel had chosen to rest their security on a different cornerstone. They chose to put their trust in their own political savvy, in military alliances. They lost trust in that which was their shelter. And for that reason, they fell. God declared through Isaiah that he would establish a cornerstone that would never fail, a stone that would be trusted because it had been tried and proven to be precious and sure. The New Testament writers recognize that this stone was Jesus Christ. Even Jesus said himself, do you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, if you've been in church long enough, 
what we often refer to as a colloquial saying, if you will, is the world. The world is in opposition to the church. As we live our lives as a Christian, there is a reference made a lot of times as a tug or a pull of the world. We have to deal with temptations. We have to deal with things that pull on our heartstrings, that flesh that seems to creep its way into our lives and pull us off course. Am I the only one that has ever been, as a child of God, go, how far off course have I gotten? It's like just Sunday, I had everything good. And by the end of the day, Monday... I'm like, I was just praying at the altar, and now I have road rage. And I don't even know if they did anything. I was just mad at them. I probably cut them off. Life has a way of pulling us. It's incredible. We spend maybe three to four hours a week in church. And for many of us, if we're honest... For many people, it's difficult that we to commit ourselves daily because life pulls at us. I do commit myself daily, but there's often a time that I have to go back to where I had made commitments. We are pulled on every hand. The amount of advertisements that you see on a daily, bla- a daily basis, it's unbelievable. The amount of information that we take in and our mind is trying to process this and the world is constantly pulling. The world is carnal. The world is fleshly. It's sinful. It's self-serving. Lover of that which is opposite of God. That is the world. Not referring to the planet, but rather that, that tug and pull of sin and the flesh on our life. The world in an effort to reject the truth of God's word has removed any stable foundation from society. I want you to hear me. In a society built on sinking sand, no wonder it feels like the world has no direction. No wonder the moral fabric is pulling apart at the seams. Cancel culture has become so prevalent that the body of Christ is increasingly fearful to offend those who disagree with the word of God. The gap between the church and the world widens as a result. And the gospel becomes more offensive. As we stand on the plumb line of truth, and as the world falls further and further into the justification of sin, we the church can begin to feel uncomfortable with the conviction of God's word. This dichotomy can quickly lead the church into the justification of sin for two reasons. Number one, we're scared to be offensive, not intentionally offensive. We're scared for what God has laid out to be truthful, to be offensive to a world that has fled so far from truth. And number two, because sin appeals to our flesh. Let me make this plain. Sin is sin if you commit it, and sin is definitely sin if I commit it. There is no in-between. Truth is truth, whether it pricks your flesh or not. Truth is truth, whether the populace believes it or not. There is no vote on truth. There is no vote on On the cornerstone. Because once the cornerstone is laid, there's no need for me and you to debate. I can simply go back and check. Might I add, this one may be a little more offensive. There is no your truth And there is no my truth. There is the truth. 
and his name is Jesus. How do we know this? Thomas said unto him, Lord, how can I know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thomas, if you're looking for the truth, I'm it. If you're wondering what the cornerstone is, I'm it. If you're wondering what conviction is, I'm it. I'm the way. I'm the truth. If you came into this building and you're looking for the truth, there is a cornerstone named Jesus. If you are weary of the sinking sand, of this world, there is a friend named Jesus. Are you tired of never measuring up to a moving target? Have you tried Jesus? As, as I look at the constant influence of, of sin and depravity that is pulling on the church, I can almost physically feel it. There's a palpable temptation of the enemy. There is an agenda of the world to capture your heart and your mind. I am weary of seeing young people walk away from God. I'm weary of just praying for backsliders while I know it's important, but what if they would have just stayed? What if when life got hard, they could go back to the cornerstone and see how their life had fallen out of alignment? If we aren't careful, we can walk the slippery edge of compromise. Look at this beautiful edifice that we've constructed. How much more beautiful would it be if every one of these seats were filled? But I will never be on a team that will fill these seats at the expense of a compromised gospel. We will fill these seats with an apostolic doctrine that is based on the cornerstone of truth, the cornerstone of holiness, the cornerstone of gospel. Because what good is it if we fill the seats, but we're so off course from the cornerstone that we don't know who we were, who we are, or where we're going. When we fill these seats, it's going to be in alignment with the truth. No matter how we try to measure to the world, the math never works out. Because we are not called to measure to the world. We are not called to make a truthful message of Christ fit a carnal agenda. There is no need to debate truth. There is no need to question truth. If I could just get back to the cornerstone. If I can align myself with his word. Why are people so distraught? Why are suicide rates on the rise? Why has society deteriorated so fast? When you remove the cornerstone, everything falls. We don't need another government program. We don't need another award show. We don't need another distraction. There needs to be a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost that will sweep not only a city but a nation of people who are hungry and crying out for God. There doesn't need to be another pretty message put together because I am not good enough to do that. There needs to be a hunger that comes from the depths of our soul that says, God, I need more of you. I've got to have more of you because I don't worship you just in spirit, but it's in spirit and in truth. We need an overflow of the love of truth. Our society is not crumbling because Jesus has left us. It's crumbling because we have left Jesus. Once the cornerstone has been removed, 
nothing will stand. Where does that leave us today? So many questions with a world that is so divisive. With a world that is so interested in your political view just so they can put you on one side of the fence or the other. With a world so committed to making you an enemy of me and vice versa. Where does that leave us when a world has forsaken God? Let me make it plain. When the world says there is no God that can save you, I can say there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men where I must be saved. When I'm overwhelmed, and I am overwhelmed often, I can say when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of God shall lift up a standard. When temptations and addictions are on every hand, I can say I will not be tempted beyond what I can bear. When the wicked and my enemies and my foes come upon me to eat of my flesh, I can remember that they stumbled and fell. When life feels insurmountable, when my hurts and my cuts are so deep, I can lift my eyes up to the hills. When it feels like death is knocking at my door, I can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Church, you hear me today? We do not measure up to the world. We measure up to the gospel that saves. We measure up to Jesus. We measure to the word. One of the worst mistakes a child of God makes is when life gets hard and instead of turning to Jesus they turn to the world there is a call that is going across this nation and you have seen it that is not a call to the world but a call to the word and there has to be a generation of young and old that will say I will not deny the gospel I will not deny the cornerstone but I'm going to go back to where it all began and I'm going to make sure that I am in alignment with the word a pilot does not fear the dark for he can reference his instruments a doctor will reference his clinical research to know how to best treat a patient a mechanic will reference the manual an architect the drawing but if you're wondering where you are in your relationship with God there is a reference but is there a hunger we are very good at playing church but Eddie you and I were talking the other day and Last uh, two or three weeks ago, or every, every week, honestly, but the presence of God has just been so thick. And you said, I wish there was a way just to make it, that moment together, just stay. Just perpetually keep that, that going. I firmly believe that God is calling us, you and me, the Church of Columbus, to a new level of consecration. Not, an, not another dimension of compromise. Not that we have. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But for you and I to get into a word and say, God, I need you to bring out of me everything that you've called me to be in full alignment with your word.
because you are the cornerstone. When a lawyer presents a legal argument, they cite an authority greater than themselves. The court is more interested in the statutes than they all are the lawyer's opinions. So a lawyer will lace his arguments with law and not opinion. Peter Like a lawyer referencing statutes looks at those around him and says, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But allow me to make a reference, Peter says. Doesn't say it that way exactly. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Peter did not conform to the judgment of everyone around him. Instead, he referenced something that was spoken long before him. This is that was spoken by the prophet Joel. Like Peter referenced Joel, allow me to reference Peter. As it was spoken by Peter the apostle, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In this room today, There's a vast array of people. There's diversity. There's a vast array of pain, history, backstory. Some of you are in the greatest time of your life. Somebody's in the worst. Some of you wanted to give up a long time ago. Maybe someone here today has never heard a message about Jesus. Maybe this is the first time you've ever walked into a church. Life seems like it's falling apart. You aren't even sure how you're going to make it through tomorrow. Can I tell you that you are exactly where you need to be? In the presence of the Lord. And when you begin to align yourself with Jesus in reference to the Word of God, I assure you, you will make it through tomorrow. Others in this room have walked with Jesus for many years, but for some reason you feel as though you've grown cold. The relationship you once had has seemingly dwindled, and you may have replaced God with something else. (laughs) You still show up, you still look the part, but your building's all out of alignment. You still raise your hands, you still praise and worship, but on the inside there seems to be this decaying of your spiritual structure. It will not be fixed by ignoring it. There has to be a return to the cornerstone. I'm going to ask all that will to come to this altar. I'm okay, I'm not, I'm okay waiting for a second. It's okay for some that don't, I understand if you don't want to. You can make an altar right where you're at. But there is a cornerstone of truth. Before you begin praying, I'm going to give some instruction in just a second. There is a cornerstone of truth. That we are called to. If you are lost today, the cornerstone tells me that there's salvation. We can get you in alignment. If you've backslid today and nothing seems to be quite right in your life, there's a cornerstone that can bring a prodigal son home. We can get you in alignment. 
But what's necessary is that you have a heart that's willing to go back to that stone. So right now, we're going to pray over both those that want to be saved and those that are repenting or trying to come back to God. Because there has to be a return to that truth for this church to move on and reach into a city and not compromise the gospel. So right now, with every eye closed and head bowed, I want to pray a prayer with you. God, I ask you to forgive us of every sin seen and unseen. For areas in my life that I know better and I've compromised your word, God, forgive me. Maybe today, God, I've never even prayed to you before. This is my first time. For those in here, would you open yourself up to Jesus? God, I'm asking that you will allow us to reconsecrate ourselves to you. Because your truth and your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, I recommit my life. I give you everything I am, everything I will be. God, in this consecration, we ask that there be anointing that flows across this building that allows us to reach a city with the whole gospel of truth. We ask that you give us the strength to build a spiritual edifice based off the cornerstone that is you. (laughs) We ask that you will begin to make way out of no way for those that don't know how they're going to make it. Allow there to be a hunger for the word. For those that have been backslidden, allow there to be a hunger for your truth. God, before you convict anybody else in this room, I ask you to convict me and then let it begin to flow that we will move ourselves into alignment with the cornerstone of your word. In Jesus' name. Now, would everyone across this building begin to worship and magnify him? Come on, let your voice out to him.